Just when you thought it was going to be smooth sailing, the state budget process might yet get a little bumpy. Hi, everyone. It's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz, joined each week by a trio of sharp-witted and short-tempered reporters from around the state, including this week, Catherine Landrigan, New Jersey Bureau Chief for Politico, Mike Kelly, columnist for The Record and NorthJersey.com, and Brent Johnson, the politics reporter for NJ Advance Media. We'll get into it with the panel in a few minutes, but we start today with a nearly $50 billion state budget and billions of extra cash floating around. Sounds like a recipe for runaway spending or a once in a generation investment opportunity. The man who's gonna close the gap between those two by the end of June is the Senate Budget Committee Chairman, Senator Paul Sarlo, and he joins us now. Senator, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on with us. It's great to be with all of you. So it would seem like a good problem to have so much money around, but in trend, it looks like it's creating tensions. Let's start with the extra three billion in uh, extra revenue OLS says the state has. Why were the pro- uh, projections from the front office so off? And is that normal? So uh, let me begin. It's a forty-eight point nine billion dollar budget, not a fifty billion dollar budget. Uh, so let me just correct you on that. Almost fifty. Um, but listen, we had great testimony the other day from the Office of Legislative Services and, and the state treasurer. And clearly, there is a three, little over $3 billion, $3.2 billion difference in their revenue forecast for the close of the current fiscal year, which ends on June 30th, and the proposed fiscal year. But it was made clear during that time that a lot of the projections from Office of Legislative Services are based on a lot of uncertainty outside of the state borders which could have an impact. We have the feds who have made it clear, the Federal Reserve made it clear that they are gonna be increasing rates pretty drastically to get inflation under control. We have the uncertainty what's happening on the Eastern side of of European with the war. We have our country talking about energy independence. We have have the, the pent up demand of the pandemic coming to an end. There's a lot of uncertainty out there right now. So a lot of those projections that Office of Legislative Services included were very rosy um, projections. Treasurer's office is taking a much more conservative approach. We will get that number, whatever that number is, we'll have that number closed after the uh, April uh, income tax collections. So, we lost you for a second there, so let me just pick up. Uh, let me have have you pick up where you were going. Okay, so um, basically, the, yeah, the 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 delta there between what Office of Legislative Services and Treasury are pro- projecting that that will get resolved by early May after the uh, income tax collections are are are, are collected, uh, and we get some better terms of where the Fed's going with controlling inflation. A lot of uncertainty out there in the world that's going to have an impact on all of our state's finances. I think when you when you when you really drill down into the Office of Legislative Services, they made it clear um, this is just a little bit um, a rosy picture. Uh, a lot of uncertainty out there with happening in the world, including uh, the war that's going on in the eastern side of Europe. Yeah, we should say revenues are certified by the governor's office, right? This has been a point of friction in the past with lawmakers accusing governors of, of not being straight with the estimates. You just think that these will balance out ultimately. These, these are going to balance out. The, the Murphy administration, to their credit, has been always very close with the Office of Legislative Services. Unlike previous years, we had more problems in the previous governor uh, dealing with uh, revenue projections. I don't think we should get caught up on that. The bottom line is we do have unprecedented amount of, of federal dollars in our budget. Uh, we have uh, revenues of stronger than ever. There's a lot to be proud of in this budget, but we need to be sure that we look at this as a two-year budgeting plan. You're going to hear me continue to say that, and we're also going to continue to hear me talk about sustainability. The investments that we make here with any of the federal dollars or the additional revenues must be able to be sustained. They can't be new programs that we can't sustain two to three years from now if we do hit that recession. 
So now we're hearing about this question of who controls that federal money that's come in, it's billions of dollars. Can you explain what the arrangement was last year between the legislature and the front office and how you think it needs to be different this year? Well, when it, the legislature's taken the approach, it doesn't need to be different. Uh, language in last year's budget, including Joint Budget Oversight Committee, which I chair, uh, it's a small committee uh, that when the governor's office, uh, the administration, I should say, wants to spend any of the federal dollars, and what we're really dealing with now is the American Rescue Plan dollars. There's yeah. about $3.2 billion left. Um, all of the care dollars were used very appropriately and wisely and, and are properly being audited. So this is the balance. They need to come to the Joint Budget Oversight Committee and ask for approval. In the budget this year, the proposed budget, governor's and budget message, they struck out one line that said the Joint Budget Oversight Committee would be able, would have to provide approval. Non-negotiable right. on the legislature side, non-negotiable. That language will be in the budget document that goes back to the governor for signature. I know what non-negotiable means, but what does non-negotiable mean in the context of budget talks? Non-negotiable enough to what? Not pass this budget? Uh, David, I don't, I don't listen. We're gonna, we're gonna have a budget on time here. Uh, yeah. is, uh, <clears throat> save the drama. Um, plan your vacation in, in early, uh, in, in middle of June, David. Uh, there's not gonna be a lot, a lot of drama, drama here. Um, we're gonna get through this, but th that was already negotiated. What I mean, non-negotiable, it was already negotiated. Governor's office already agreed that the Joint Budget Oversight Committee would play an important role. The legislature shall should play an important role in making sure the federal dollars are wisely spent. Again, you're going to hear me talk a lot about two-year budget process, making sure we can sustain it, strategic investments. These are need to be infrastructure, brick and mortar. How do we help grow the economy? Uh, school construction, uh, think, you know, infrastructure and, 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 and investments such as that. All right, let me get a panel question here. Catherine, you had a question? Hi, yes, I did. Um, affordability has been a common refrain amongst Democrats and, and Republicans. Is there anything specific that you'd like to see added into the spending plan that is sent back to the governor that goes beyond his initial proposal? Right, so his initial proposal, which we're taking a very close look at, is the anchor plan, which replaces the old homestead rebate program. Um, it is clearly something that touches uh, many New Jerseyans and, and puts money back directly into their their pocket. Listen, you, you touched upon a key word, affordability issues, right? I think we learned from the last election, um, pocketbook issues never change. And New Jersey, um, when it comes to pocketbook issues, is a very, very moderate state when it comes to pocketbook issues. There's been some talk, Senator, about reinstating the cost of living adjustments to public employee pensions. They've been frozen since 2011. Some lawmakers want to restore them. What about you? Listen, uh, we've had many good public servants who have served our, our state in, in many different departments over the years. Um, and some live in New Jersey, some do not live in New Jersey. Um, are they entitled to a COLA? Yes, but we have to make sure we keep that in line. Uh, <clears throat> it is probably it's a two billion dollar hit to our to our to our pension system that we would need to come up with. Right now, we for the first time ever in the history of the state of New Jersey, we've hit the hundred percent actual uh, actuary requirement, uh, historic this year, uh, and we did it last year as well. So two years in a row, we're we're we're, we're we've turned the corner. On, on shoring up our pension system. So any additional hits onto it needs to be taken with a very closer look. Let me get another quick question in here. Um, talking about these Christmas tree items, was it you the other day who said that you're okay with them so long as people say where they're going and who's involved? I didn't, I didn't make that statement. You must have somebody anyway, else. So what, what's your sense of the Christmas tree items this year with all this? Let, let's we also forget the word Christmas tree items, right? But again, I go back to a strategic investment in constructing a school or turning a um, <clears throat> turning a, a an open space that has been undeveloped and polluted um, that floods flood mitigation into an open space pedestrian for a city or a municipality investing in a parking garage. Um, are they Christmas tree items? It, it make it's sexy for you guys to call them Christmas tree items. But that is a strategic investment, and that is where we could use some of those federal dollars. 
All right, Paul Sorrow, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on with us. Thank you, guys. Keep up the good work out there. God bless. All right, Catherine, Mike, Brent, good to see you all. Uh, so there's the budget chairman. Catherine, you're watching this process. This process, is it going to be smooth sailing or might there be rough waters ahead? I it would be very smooth sailing. I mean, I think the legislature and the governor's office had an opportunity for a real reset. Obviously, uh, former President Steve Sweeney and the governor didn't have the best relationship. Um, and it seems as though Scutari and Murphy, um, you know, do a much better relationship, which is true. But I think the fact that the governor took out this JBOC language was a huge misstep and it really angered a lot of lawmakers. Um, and so it definitely does not put them on the right footing. Um, so we'll see. I mean, it angered some lawmakers, but did it anger them enough to to revolt against this budget? It doesn't seem so. What do you think? No, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, uh, you know, I, they definitely support the budget. I think there's nothing really that I'm hearing that is, you know, materially going to change from, from Democrats. Right. Um, I just think that in terms of a relationship, it could just make it more difficult and maybe they could lead to bicker over, you know, things that maybe they wouldn't have initially. All right. Brent, when people start using words like non-negotiable, that tends to have an impact on like negotiations. Is there trouble looming over the control of these federal funds or, or is that just, um, that's not gonna happen? I can't, I can't imagine this would be the thing that would cause a shutdown or some sort right. of major drama over the, over the state budget. Because if it's July 1st and I have to cancel my vacation to Denel and I don't think I'm gonna be very happy. So, but, um, but, but yeah, I don't, I don't foresee this being the kind of thing that torpedoes the state budget there's too much money and, and too much revenue to, to deal with this time. And it seems like to, to have major problems over this would be, would be short-sighted, but it is something they have to work out. And uh, I'm not quite sure how it does. You know, this is only the beginning of these arguments. So did you say you were going to vacation in Donellan? I mean, it's where the first quick check was found. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Jersey vacation right there. Mike, <laughs> so much so much money floating around the state capitol. Should it make taxpayers what? nervous? Yeah, it's kind of like that old novel, you know, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's novel, Treasure Island. It's You've got all the pirates uh, together and they all want a piece of the, the pie, so to speak. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, is a prescription, I think, for all kinds of fighting. I would, I really like what Carlos said about infrastructure. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you that our state needs massive infrastructure upgrades. And I would like to see uh, the leadership in the state, Sarlo included, and just come up with a series of uh, infrastructure plans that go beyond what we're talking about right now. We really re need to rebuild the bridges and the roads and, and, and the rails in New Jersey. All right, Mike, we're losing half of your head. So if you could just tilt your, uh, your laptop back a little bit so we could get some headspace above you. Election season has head. begun. All right, election season has begun. Primaries are set in both parties. Not a lot of surprises, but the Republicans we've been talking to are feeling pretty confident. Let's hear from GOP strategist Chris Russell, who was on chat box with us this week. Listen, I believe, I truly believe this, that that, that I think uh, Andy Kim, Mikey Sherrill, and Josh Geithammer are all vulnerable uh, in, in a huge wave. Even someone like Frank Pallone is, is potentially in the mix. I understand these are difficult districts. The Democrats did a, a wonderful gerrymander of the congressional map a few months back and, and made these districts less competitive, but not in a year like this, because the, the, the key is Andy Kim knows this, Gottheimer, Cheryl, Joe Biden is on the ballot. All right, uh, Brent, Kim, Gottheimer, Cheryl, even Frank Pallone, all vulnerable. What do you think? I mean, I don't know if it goes that far, but this is definitely a, a difficult climate for Democrats. Um, a poll came out yesterday from Monmouth University showing that the state still wants uh, the Democratic, uh, the Democrats to control the Congressional Caucus. But as we saw this past November, um, you know, there's Republican sentiment out there and, and 
uh, you know, anger that that could make this a very volatile election again, and uh, just for Democrats across the country. And and if New Jersey is in that, it goes to show how uh, difficult this might be for Democrats. And because that same poll showed that Biden is underwater in New Jersey, and in a deep blue state, that's not good. But you know, I I don't I, I think Malinowski is the most vulnerable. Um, <clears throat> if Mikey Carroll loses, that's a big blow because she's considered a possible gubernatorial candidate in a few years. But, you know, we saw Steve Sweeney go down in November. So, you know, anything's possible. Catherine, you get the feeling that the red wave that uh, drove Sweeney out of office will continue into the midterms? That's Yeah, I mean, it's possible. I mean, I think um, I completely agree with what Brent said. I mean, I think the biggest thing that was interesting from that poll this week is just how poorly, um, you know, Biden is doing in New Jersey, kind of showing this enthusiasm gap. And it'll be interesting to see whether that translates, um, you know, at the ballot box. But, but yeah, I mean, last November was was a huge shock. Um, you know, the polling did not indicate, you know, or predict what what could happen. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to see what's going to happen. Yeah. Right. Mike, uh, Biden's an albatross today. Will he be an albatross come November? Uh, I think he will. Uh, and I, I think that's too bad for the Democrats. But here's the key, I think, for Republicans. They need to keep Trump off the ballot. Uh, if, the, if the Republicans talk about bread and butter, kitchen table issues like the economy and that sort of thing, they might pick up a seat or two here in New Jersey. I wouldn't be surprised if they pick up two seats. If Trump is on the ballot, in other words, if Trump is part of the mix and you get this debate about what the Republican Party really is and whether or not it's too radical, I think uh, that'll, be a, that'll be a favorable sign for the Democrats. Let's talk about these Monmouth polls a little bit more. Murphy up over 50 percent, assuming he doesn't run for president. Biden is way down, yet Booker is up. Even Menendez is stabilized. Can you please interpret the psyche of the New Jersey electorate, <laughs> Brent Johnson? Um, I think it shows that while New Jersey is a blue state, it's not like, you know, really deep blue. I mean, you know, a lot of these a lot of people make decisions based on the person and not just the party. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think after our previous governor ran for president, I don't think uh, residents want to see any governor again run for president. Uh, and that that could be what's affecting uh, Murphy. And that's not to say anything negative about Christie. It's just I just don't think any any, any New Jersey wants a governor running for president. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's just it's just people just have their personal preferences and, and they, can, they can go all over the place. And at the same time. I mean, you know, you see Biden way down, but how much different is he philosophically from, say, a Cory Booker, who's up over 55 percent? It's a it, we're we're a weird state for that kind of thing, aren't we? Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, New Jersey in general is just an interesting state. And I think our politics prove that, uh, you know, it's us in Illinois in terms of the politics that really people pay attention to when it comes to the good and the bad. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's why I think November sh will show that anything is possible. All right, Catherine, 300 million in child care infrastructure bills uh, from the Senate majority leader. Didn't get a chance to ask uh, the budget chair about this. Um, it's coming from the majority leader, so that means it's got green lights all the way to the governor's desk, no? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually interviewed um, the Senate Majority Leader the other week, and she teased that this was going to be a huge part of her package. Um, you know, her her overall um, package that she's looking at is not just child care, but kind of looking at constituencies that maybe have been a little bit more left out in Trenton um, in the past, um, people who are poor, people of color, um, and she feels, you know, very strongly about this. So. I do think this is definitely going to be a package that is negotiated as part of the budget um, in the assembly. Um, Eliana Pinto Marin, the budget chair, said that kind of signaled the, you know, that this was something that was going to be done as part of the budget. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think it's definitely it's definitely going to happen. Uh, Murphy had done a bit on childcare, um, but this goes a lot further. This is kind of like a really big bold statement from the. Senate Majority Leader, who appears ready to assert herself, at least in terms of, of policy stuff, right? Yes, definitely. I think she wants to set an agenda, um, you know, and, and follow through on it, just like, you know, in 
distinguish herself, um, you know, from the previous uh, majority leader who obviously also had a massive impact um, in terms of policy. Mike Kelly, I got a minute or so. Can you talk about the next in your series on the 9-11 Saudi connection? Yeah, some of you may know I've been uh, diving deep into uh, the connection between the Saudi Arabian government and 9-11. And what I'm looking at now is a Saudi connection to Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, it's part It's part of a, a, a long piece of research that I'm doing and I think is very important to the whole 9-11 story. Good. We'll look forward to that. Brent, uh, judge rules this week uh, that a bribe is a bribe is a bribe. Um, what's the impact of something like that going to be going forward? We're talking about the case of Jason O'Donnell. Yeah, I mean, that's a very New Jersey story uh, when we have to yeah. define bribe in court. Um, yeah, I mean, it shows that basically it basically tells people who are running for office that you don't have to be in elected office to commit bribery. Um, so that, that could have wide reaching implications, because if that wasn't the case, then that would that could be open season for for candidates to uh, to right. accept bribes. So, yeah, again, a very Mike, New Jersey story. Feel- yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, Mike, I feel like like you love this story of the cattle scandal and all of that. Amazing that we have a judge saying, a judge in Hudson County, no less, David, telling us that, well, that really isn't a bribe. But then you have the appeals court saying, no, a bribe is a bribe. You know how I look at this, though? Like, if this is a bribe, what is a campaign contribution? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I Seriously. guess it's just a matter of the kind of language you use. Depends on what your definition of is, is. Yes, absolutely. It isn't really money. (laughs) Right. Catherine, same day voter registration, Murphy and McCurgy and and Cunningham had an op-ed in support of it. Senate Mm -hmm. President Scutari is kind of skeptical. Is that going to happen? I think he needs to be convinced. Um, He was asked about it um, after one of the the Senate sessions, and he he expressed hesitancy towards it. So um, I think, you know, if that's something that the governor really wants to accomplish, he's going to have to really sit down and make it a priority. Brent, I get the feeling that uh, Democrats, having seen the the results of the gubernatorial race, are, are feeling a little bit like they have the ability to push back against this governor. Is, is that sense right? Yeah, I don't know if it's as obvious, but there definitely there definitely is a sense that no one came out of November's election feeling really great on the Democratic side. Um, so, yeah, you might see a little bit 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 more uh, hesitancy. You've already seen hesitancy about pushing some more progressive things and pushing more afford- affordability things. And maybe there's, you know, uh, you know, you might see that in the budget talks going back to what we talked about in the beginning. So, yeah, there could be a bit of that. And a happy first birthday to my daughter, Everly. I just want to get that in there. <laughs> Already making her a Mets fan, are you? Yes, I am. Go Mets. Uh, Mike Kelly, some some thoughts yeah. on the confirmation uh, hearings this week and, and the historic moment that we witnessed. Oh my goodness! I think this is a this is a huge moment in American history. Uh, the fact that we have a, a black female justice on the Supreme Court—it's been a long time coming. I'm delighted to see it happen. Uh, quite frankly, I, I, when I watched the um, the way the Senate handled this, particularly the Judiciary Committee and the entire Judiciary Committee lining up against her, I just thought that was shameful. This is a this is a woman who has really put the time in and really built the track record. And I thought some of the charges that were thrown at her. Uh, particularly with regard to the child porn cases that she handled, I thought were really, really misconstrued. And it's it's sad. But I'm glad she got through it. And I think she'll be a great justice. All right, panel, Catherine, Brent, Mike, great to see you guys. Thanks for coming on. That is Roundtable for this week. Our thanks also to Senate Budget Committee Chairman Paul Sarlo. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz and Jay. And subscribe to the YouTube channel for more from Chatbox, Business Beat, NJ Spotlight News, and a whole bunch of other shows that are going to be coming online in the months ahead, plus lots of other live streams. We're off for the holiday next week. 
I'm David Cruz. Thanks for watching. For all the crew over here, have a safe, peaceful holiday, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954, and by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com.